such an honor to be able to preach to you guys, especially with one of my best friends visiting Women's Midweek. Can we give it up for Montgomery Dimitri? <laughs> wow, when you get to preach among friends. And so as I thought about this lesson, um, it's awesome because Salma asked me to preach a lesson inspired by uh, Kwiku Sarkodie's D group lesson entitled Next Man Up. And so the title of this one lesson is Next Woman Up. <laughs> and as I was reflecting on the lesson and what I wanted to share with you guys today, I was reminded of the uh, musical Hamilton. And if you haven't seen it, go see it. I'm not a fan of musicals and I loved Hamilton. Um, and the setting of it is in America, when it's first being brought up and created, the people are rebelling against Europe, against the Catholic Church, and their goal is to start a revolution. And it follows one woman in the beginning, her name is Angelica. She was a rich woman who was discontent with living a life without meaning. She wanted to be a part of the change. Because in that time, a lot of the women were considered second-class citizens. They couldn't vote. They couldn't uh, really do anything. And they couldn't work. They just had to stay home, be married, and take care of the kids. Funny enough, that's some of our prayer requests right now. Like, that's what I want my life to be. <laughs> um, but she sings a song in the beginning, or she raps it. I'm not going to rap for you, but I'm going to read the lyrics. It says, I've been reading Common Sense by Thomas Paine, so men say that I'm intense or I'm insane. You want a revolution? I want a revelation, so listen to my declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And when I meet Thomas Jefferson, I'm going to compel him to co include women in the sequel. Look around, look around at how lucky we are to, to be alive right now. Look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. History is happening in Manhattan, and we just happen to be in the greatest city in the world, in the greatest city in the world. And as we look around, I believe we can all say that Metro Coast is very different than it was 18 months ago. The spirit is different, the energy is different, the way we fight in the battle is different. I mean, look around. Raise your hand if you've been baptized in the last two years. Wow, that's half of the room. And now we are amongst change again. As leaders and friends leave, I believe the angels in heaven are on the edge of their seats as they wait to see what Metro Coast will do next. Angelica's eyes were open as she realized she was going to witness history. And in the same way, sisters, as I preach to you tonight, I want to challenge you to look around because how lucky we are to be alive right now, to be a part of the revolution, to be a part of history as Metro Coast will be off to do even greater things. Point number one is hear the call. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter three. And so guys, this is gonna be a bit of a Bible study. We're gonna be turning some pages. And so just stick with me and we'll be okay. And so when you get there, it'll be Ezekiel chapter three. And we're gonna look at verse three. So it says, then he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. He then said to me, son of man, go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and strange language, but to people of Israel. Not to many people, not to many people of obscure speech and strange language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because you are not, 
because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate, but I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. And he said to me, son of man, listen carefully and take heart to the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. Then the spirit lifted me up and I heard before me a loud rumbling sound as the glory of the Lord raised me from the place where it was staying. If you drop down to verse 14, the spirit then lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord on me. Wow. So a lot's happening here, but contextually, Ezekiel, he's a priest in Babylon. He was, um, a, he was a butcher because he was a priest, and he was an advisor, but God was calling him to a career change, to be a prophet, to preach God's word. How do you feel about it? He was angry and he was bitter. It actually says later on that he went amongst the people, but he sat there for seven days in complete silence. I don't know if you guys have ever been there where you've been called to do something you you don't really want to do and you decide to be obedient anyways. Sometimes it's our fear or just being tired from the week that makes obedience a drag. Other times it can be fear or faithlessness that we can't do something that makes us frustrated. Even in experience, Ezekiel was called to, even in inexperience, we see Ezekiel called to do something that he wasn't, he had never done before. And now in Ezekiel, in now with God calling him, God also says, hey, by my judge of the heart, the people are also not open. But you're going to preach anyways. That's a difficult place to be. But ultimately, he pointed back to the fact that it's not man who sent him. It was God's hand that was on him. We are about to see the West be turned upside down, right? Even in Southland, we saw a valiant woman, Kiana, who had to step away from her post. Who's going to lead her Bible talk? We have the powerful Monse, who's pregnant. Who's going to be there to help lift up her arms and do those Bible studies? Let's face it. To see Metro Coast go to even greater heights, it's going to take every single one of us doing things we've never done before. It'll take us being, it'll take us allowing God to be, to put us in the uncomfortable situations in order to catch the vision. What's the urgency though? Look at Ezekiel 3 verse 16. It says, at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life. That wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person, and they do not turn away from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will die for their sin, but you will have saved yourself. What's the urgency? The lost and the saved could die if we don't answer the call of God. Catching the vision is not just about you and what you believe God is calling you to do. Catching the vision is about persevering, doing the uncomfortable so that we can see a lost world saved. And so as I look out, I know I'm looking at a group of women from the teen ministry all the way to the women of wisdom who are totally sold out who are willing to answer the call to catch the vision and see Metro Coast do even greater things. And so today, I want to learn how God does this with us by studying out Paul. Point number two is catch the vision for your life. Let's look at Acts chapter 9. And so in Acts chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 1. Don't worry, it's seltzer water, okay? (laughs) Point number one, catch the vision for your life. Acts 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out 
murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything, for they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Point number two, catch the vision for your life. So here we see Paul, which is right now he saw, and he was stopped dead in his tracks in order to answer the call of God. See, Paul, well, Saul right now. See, Saul was a man who was well-learned, well-trained. He was a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He had studied out the Jewish culture, and he thought he knew the will of God for his life. He was someone who chased uh, and fought against the disciples for years. And his goal in this journey that he was in was not only to arrest, but also hopefully kill those from the way. By merit, this man had the perfect education, the perfect background, and he was even influential amongst his peers. But I believe God works in mysterious ways. See, not just for Saul, but for each and every one of us. In order to catch the vision, he had to be blinded. What are the ways that you have been blind to the calling of God? What excuses or ideas in your heart keep us from answering the call of God? See here, even there was a disciple named Ananias who was called by God to restore Saul's vision and baptize him. And due to Saul's reputation, not even the man of God sent to study the Bible with him believed he could actually be saved. He too was blind of what a true Christian would look like before they even met Jesus. I think about the people we have in our life as examples. I think of Sarah. You know, some people don't know, but Sarah was a drag racer, okay? She raced cars. She also was a cheerleader. And a, she even said once she was a hippie, or she was a hippie for a little bit. And yet you look at Sarah, and you would never guess that Sarah would be now leading the L.A. church. I also think of Salma, who was half Catholic, half kind of Muslim gal, and she was actually competing to uh, play soccer in other countries. She had gone through so much in her life, and yet you wouldn't have looked at her and said, oh yeah, you're going to be a women's ministry leader. And yet truly standing before us is a powerful woman of God. Sisters, you've got to see past your skills to see who God wants you not only to be, but to reach out to. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. I love this scripture because we clearly see that Ananias didn't only just not believe that Saul was going to be saved, but he didn't really want to baptize him. And in order to catch the vision, he had to trade in the vision he had for his own life. Saul had to see that he wasn't going to be the type of man that he thought he was. And Ananias had to see that the kingdom wasn't exactly what he thought it was. They both had to drop the scales of fear and impossibilities. 
I know as I've studied the Bible with a lot of the women in here, many of you, you know, sometimes I didn't think you was going to make it. And don't worry, I told you. (laughs) And yet I even had to rely on God because I see some amazing women who not only have studied the Bible, but have now baptized great friends. And the scales in your eyes, they may be your limitations. They may be God's limitations. You may be thinking to yourself, see, I, I want to answer the vision for God has, that God has for me, but my husband isn't a disciple. Or <laughs> I, I want to answer the call, but I have children. You may think, well, I'm too young spiritually. I might be too young physically. But sisters, I tell you that God has no limits. You may think to yourself, I don't got the look of all the other leaders that are chosen. I don't have their demeanor. I'm louder. I'm I'm a little wilder. And I got to tell you, God calls you too. At the end of the day, the greatest thing that we can be afraid of is ultimately what comes with the vision of God, the suffering. Catching the vision is catching all of it. We read through the book of Acts, an unprecedented time of men and women who left everything behind in order to build God's kingdom on earth. And so ready or not, we all signed up for this. It's time to open your eyes, drop the scales, and catch the vision. Because I tell you, ready or not, it will be given to you. Ready or not, you will be called. I got the call last night to write this lesson. And ready or not, here I am. (laughs) So you might go, well, how do I do this? How do I catch the vision that God has for me? By having a here am I, send me attitude. Don't be afraid because you haven't done it. I know coming to UCLA, I had no idea what to expect. But the scales were huge on my eyes. I thought, you know. I'll be a Bible talk leader and baptize a couple people, and I'm going to help nanny for Sarah. I'm going to get a nice, easy job. It's going to be chill. But God had different plans. The job did not come, and I ended up nannying and overseeing about 15 women. (laughs) And in my fear, I hadn't seen that done before. So I wanted to shrink back when it came towards the end of the year. But Despite the panic and a little bit of fear, God reminded me of the time when I wrote my goals, when I didn't have scales over my eyes. At the end of this year, I opened my journal and I actually looked at my 2024 goals and it said, add nine women, I mean, it said add nine people to the Bible talk. I said, just give us people. And then I prayed for God to split the Bible talk. Looking back, God did exactly that to a T. Laura now helped me split the Bible talk, and she leads her own Bible talk. And God added exactly nine faithful women. (laughs) And so I want to challenge you guys, all of you. What would you dream of doing for God? In what way would you help build up the walls of the kingdom? if there were no scales, if there were no limits, and if there weren't any fears. Tomorrow morning in your quiet time, let the scales go. Catch God's vision and write it down. And maybe you're like Saul, and you need to go to your Ananias to help remove the scales. Ask your disciple, discipler, how can I help? I promise you she'll have an answer for you. Because... Suffering, no suffering. Fear, no fear. God has a vision, and you will be unfulfilled until you grab a hold of it, unless you drop your vision and gain God's. Point number two, or point number three, a vision for the young. Let's look at verse 26. And so... Acts 9, verse 26, it says, When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Dang. 
But Barnabas took him in and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And so, imagine being Saul. You repent. You become a faith-filled disciple. You join the kingdom of God, and nobody believes you. <laughs> like, my man is on the inside and still on the outside. I think about what that could feel like. He probably felt afraid. I'm sure he was tempted to maybe doubt his calling because he didn't feel connected. You know, sometimes when we first get baptized, we might not feel super connected. We don't got all the lingo down. We don't say, come on, bro, at the right times. And maybe sometimes you start a clapper and nobody claps with you. And it's hard. <laughs> it's hard being a baby Christian sometimes. It's hard to be young. But imagine Saul. Among the crowds, they would have known people who, who he might have arrested and even killed. It was because Ananias and Barabbas, or Barnabas, because they were willing to catch a vision for the young, that Saul was not only allowed to become a Christian, they made it possible for him to stay a Christian. You look at Barnabas, and this man was wealthy, but other than that, he didn't really have a title. He was a nobody. He was just faithful in the church. He was a part of the singles ministry, and he was just cranking it out, living his life. And at the time, no one knew who Saul would be. So when Barnabas looked over at him, he was just looking at an ex-killer and a new Christian. But Barnabas had the heart to pull him in and love him. And it allowed the whole family to then see him and even embrace him. I know for us, we can see people get baptized. And sometimes we can go, you know, that's awesome. But she's not in my Bible talk. And that's awesome. Good job for that ministry. And wow, that's awesome. Her disciple is going to have a lot of work, though. And you know, I know y'all respond because you thought it before. <laughs> and here's the thing. I want to lift up a very special sister. I don't even know if she's here today, but uh, Ashley Ajayi. And the reason why I want to lift her up is because when I first moved to L.A., I was overwhelmed at just all the new people, where we were living. We didn't have a home. I was on the floor figuring life out. And I remember going to staff, and uh, I walked to the bathroom. And I was like, I just got to get myself together. And Ashley Ajayi was sitting on the, the uh, couch of the Hilton in, um, what's that place called? Anaheim. There we go. And that wasn't really important. But I walked in, and she saw me. And she looked at me, and she says, are you OK? And literally, you know when you like, and you're, and you're like, I got to hold it in. And literally, I weep. And she pulls me down next to her, and she just lays me on her chest. <laughs> and she just bats my shoulder. And as I'm crying, I'm in my head, I'm like, you look like a fool. What are you doing? And I like, and I tried to stop the tears. I couldn't. They kept coming. And my heart was just pouring out and I was so grateful for Ashley because she didn't know me. She's holding me and like, by the way, what's your name? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm a nobody. I'm like, I'm Brianna. <laughs> and she's just, okay. And she's just patting my shoulder. But I'm telling you guys, that moment is stuck with me. I am so grateful for Ashley Ajayi and all of her love. But we need more Ashley Ajayi. We need more Cecilias. We need more people to pull in the baby Christians. We need more people to see that sister who hasn't quite made that friend yet or best friend. And you, you just pull her in because you love her. From experience, I'm telling you, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. 
to feel loved. It makes all the difference when someone sees you. And it feels all the difference. It, it, it's all the difference when someone embraces you. I want to challenge you guys. If you're not discipling someone, especially, look at the person next to you. Find someone in your row, because the person next to you, you already know them. I just saw it. (laughs) But find someone you don't know and just hug her. Ask her how she's doing. That young sister who you know just got baptized, invite her to lunch, okay? I, I promise you it'll make the world a difference of helping her actually stay a true disciple. As we look at Barnabas, we see that at the end of the day, love literally covered over a multitude of sins. His identity and his reputation was forever changed, and it was out of an act of love. And so find the sister who needs your love. Give to her. Point number three, become a student of your calling. Let's keep going. Let's look at Acts 11. And so in Acts 11, verse 19, it says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And so what's awesome here is at the end of the day, Jesus's goal was to see disciples of all nations to be baptized. But the reality is after Acts 2, the disciples kind of stayed in Jerusalem. And so what got them going? A little suffering? a little pressure called persecution. And in that moment, what's so powerful is it produced an entire church. The thing is, look back in the scriptures. What evangelist started the church? Did you notice it? There was no name. No name disciples who just loved God preached the word, even when they were afraid, and produced an entire church. What does that tell you? That when Acts 2, when it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, it wasn't an exaggeration. It's something we can sometimes look past. No, they all, every single one of them sat at the apostles' feet, and they devoted themselves. They became students. They learned, and they produced a church. They weren't teachers. They weren't evangelists. Think about it. Could someone send you to a random city with maybe your household and you produce a church? Because according to the book of Acts, that's exactly what God expects us to be able to do. So whether you're in the teens ministry, the campus ministry, the singles, or the married. God expects you to do great things. And I love this because this wasn't about a kingdom dream. This wasn't about a title. This wasn't about what you signed up for that's extra. This was just what it looked like to be a disciple. This was the training of a basic Christian. And so my sisters, We are in a place in Metro Coast where we have the opportunity to sit among many great, powerful, amazing women. I think of Regine, who's been from New York to California, literally across country. And she's a women's ministry leader. 
it's not up to just the people she disciples to be studying her very moves. It's up to each and every one of you. Have you sat and talked to Donna? I sat with Donna, and I was just blown away. I said, what in the world? And you look at Donna, and you're like, man, that's one amazing woman. And then you see her with her husband, and you're like, that's one amazing wife. And then you see her with her kids, and she's an amazing mom. You go to her house, she's a fantastic host. But I bet you didn't know Donna was also an incredible, revolutionary women's ministry leader who fled war, okay? And now you sit and you talk to Donna and you got no idea who you're talking to, who's giving you advice. Guess what though? You all are Donna's. You all should be able to be called to do anything, go anywhere and literally give up everything. And it's not because you wanna be in the ministry, it's because you love God. And so if you haven't been studying in this way, if you haven't been training in this way, if you haven't been at the feet of the women around you, I want to call you repent because this is basic discipleship. <laughs> when you look at these guys, it's wild. Like I, I consider uh, this, this church being planted and they're like, OK, let's just call Barnabas and Barnabas goes and it cranks. But you know who he grabs? Saul the guy who was run out of Jerusalem and now was preaching alone and doing all this stuff. And he goes, you know who I want beside me? The weakest. Who are you grabbing to be your right hand? Are you only looking at the outside? Because I got to tell you, some of the people who come in, the rockiest, actually do the greatest. And so it's important for all of us. You can look and go, God can use me. Oh, yeah, if you're thinking that, he probably has a great plan for you. If you're thinking to yourself, yeah, but not me, like, trust me, it's you. It's 100% you. <laughs> so don't sit in the back, sit in the front, okay? Because <laughs> you catch the shrapnel, and it's a great place to learn. At the end of the day, their partnership was impactful in this very sin city with Barnabas and Saul, the Christian, the disciples were first called Christians. They set the tone. Two people who were nobodies made something. It makes me think of Deshay, who <laughs> bravely came up to me, and even though she was fearful, she said, I wanna be a part of ICC, ICCM admin. And I go, wow, okay, and we're gonna get her. I thought about Valentina, who was pretty quiet and yet now leads a Bible talk and is a John 4 disciple. I want to call you to look at the place where you can give impact. I think of Ashley, who, you know, in the beginning was by herself, and now there's like 12 women who are part of AV making our services crank. Think about it. No name disciples fleeing persecution, built a church. What can we do? Let's look at Acts 13, verse 1. It says, Now in the church at Antioch, there are prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. They've grown. And now they got some titles. But it's crazy because usually lists are made in status, and we see that Saul is last. But keep going. Look at verse 9. It says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Eliamus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are called, you are full of all kinds of greed kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Point number three, embrace the call. I mean, point number four, sorry. Point number four, embrace the call. In this moment, Saul steps into the light of his calling. Imitating his teacher, he opens his mouth and he preaches the word of God, full of zeal. 
And what's so powerful is that from Acts 13, verse 1, he's like named last. But by the time you get to verse 9, it's then Saul, who was called Paul, and he's the one flat preaching the word of God. The time between Acts 9 and Acts 13 is about 12 years. And his training, his studying of his mentors, allowed him to step into his true calling. He isn't just imitating Barnabas and the men of God he walked with. He imitated Jesus himself. Why? Because this was the very miracle done on him. And now he gets to the place where he can do the very miracles Jesus did. You cannot begin to understand what God has for you. I think of Sarah, and honestly, I get to sit at her feet almost every day. And I'm just in awe at how God continues to stretch her, to push her, to call her higher. And it's not even done. You, you would think after, what, 22 years of being a disciple, it's like, you know, God, you, you there, you have reached it. And yet, I look at Sarah's life and all the things going on, and I'm like, oh my gosh, God is just getting started with her. He's stretching her reach far beyond L.A. And though uncomfortable, I'm really proud of Sarah. Because she raises her children full of joy, her house is full of love and zeal and excitement. And though suffering, she is one of the funniest people you will ever meet. I pray that for years to come, it is not just me, but all of us, sitting and learning as we watch a woman of God step into the greater calling. What's so powerful is that the 12-year journey from Saul to Paul was really about humility. Because notice, the whole time he was going by Saul. It's humility because in the Greek, the word Saul, it means great man. But the word Paul, it actually means small or humble. What was God doing? He was humbling him. Allow God, as you are on this path of transition, to humble you. Because it really is true. Times and change are coming. And we got to step up. Let's close out in Acts 13. Verse 13, it says, From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Poseidon Antioch. And so from right here, what's so powerful is that at the end of the day, you see that now it's not Barnabas leading the group. It's not anyone else, but it's Paul. He's now stepping into his role. And we have so much of the New Testament because he allowed himself to be trained. Ladies, let, let it not be said that the women who are waiting on your path to be saved may not make it because you are too afraid, too faithless, too selfish. I hope through studying out these scriptures, that you really believe me when I tell you that you are called. When I tell you to drop the scales of what you think is important. Because there are those who are waiting on you. Not your mentor, not your Bible talk leader, not your church leader. As you step into your role, remember to bring a couple of people with you. Really quick. I just want to look at this scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 9, it says, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark 
and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in the ministry. And so here we look on at the scripture and we see that uh, that Barnabas asked for, for John Mark. But if you're re- familiar with the book of Acts, at one point, John Mark had actually uh, separated from Paul and Silas because of a disagreement. But guess what? Barnabas, after training Paul, went back to train John Mark. So at the end of Paul's journey, the very man he was separated from, he now needed. And he was helpful in the Lord. It's not enough for us to be great. Grab your sister. Bring her with you. In closing, my sisters, it has been a joy to not only be in the West, but to be your friend, your sister, and to preach to you tonight. The book of Acts was truly history being made. It was called the Acts of the Apostles, but I think studying through the scriptures, we see that it ultimately was the Acts of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, 3,000 were baptized. They had come for vacation, but they stayed for the kingdom. This is us. We are Acts 2 continued, and the world is watching to see if we too will turn this world upside down. And I know that because we are sold out women, ready to catch the vision, sit at our leader's feet, and walk in the light and embracing calling, we too will turn the world upside down. Thank you.